Hello everyone, what is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct, you guys. Thank you so much for joining me here today. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button, that way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every single Wednesday and you are not going to want to miss it. Now, before we get into today's episode, just a little disclaimer, just a little PSA, I am getting over some sort of sickness, cold, illness, something. Something has taken over me these past few days and it's been pretty brutal, but hopefully you can't hear it. But if you can, I wanted to say that that's what that was. So just wanted to give that little disclaimer, but that is not why we are here today. Today we are here to discuss the solved case of Liz Sullivan. Now, while this is a solved case, it definitely is going to leave you with a lot of questions by the end of it. And I'm really interested to hear what you guys have to say about this case, what your take on everything is, because it really is a mind-blowing case and one that I definitely think deserves more attention. So with that being said, let's jump right on into it today. Elizabeth Ricks Sullivan, who went by Liz, was born on August 14th, 1983. Now, unfortunately, there is very little out there about Liz's upbringing. Her father's name is Rick Edwards, and Liz graduated from Cacocton High School in 2001. However, that was the most that I could find about the facts of her upbringing. Now, what we do know, however, However, is that Elizabeth was someone with a larger than life personality. She had a bright, vibrant personality. She was described by her friends as being brilliant. She was incredibly smart. She was incredibly social. She had a lot of friends. She loved being by her friend's side. Whatever it is that they were doing, they always had a great time together. Liz also had a lot of hobbies that consisted of dancing, specifically ballet, as well as writing and at the time of her disappearance, she was juggling with the idea of becoming a professional writer. Now, in her adult years, Liz was living in Norfolk, Virginia, which is right near the Navy base called Naval Station Norfolk, which just so happens to be the largest Navy base in the world. Now, it was while Liz was living in Virginia that she ended up meeting a man named Matthew Sullivan. And as you can probably tell by the last name, things went very well for the two of them in the beginning. Matt grew up in Minnesota before moving to Norfolk folk to enlist in the Navy. Liz saw a lot of potential in Matt. When she looked at him, she saw stability and security. And soon enough, just after a few months of dating, Matt was actually reassigned to San Diego. Now, once he was made aware of this news, Matt and Liz had multiple different conversations and they decided that they did not want to break up. They wanted to continue their relationship, so much so that Matt ended up proposing to Liz right before their move to San Diego, and she said yes. So now Matt and Liz are engaged, they're moving, and not only that, in the midst of this move, Liz found out that she was pregnant with her and Matt's first child. Now, Liz was absolutely shocked when she found out that she was pregnant, but she was equally over the moon. Now, when they moved to San Diego, it did not take long for Matt to be deployed overseas, which left Liz to finish out the remainder of her pregnancy on her own, and this was something that was very difficult difficult for her, understandably. She had just uprooted her life and moved to a completely new city, and now her fiancé had left as well. So there was a lot of unfamiliarity, and it became very overwhelming. And Matt actually also ended up missing the birth of their daughter. That was something that was very hard for Liz as well. That was a moment that she was looking forward to sharing with Matt, so that was difficult for her. However, ultimately, Matt was able to meet his daughter for the first time when he returned back to San Diego and they were able to bond the three of them as a family. Now shortly after Matt returned to San Diego is when he was deployed yet again and just like the first time when Matt was deployed again, Liz found out that she was pregnant with their second child 
after Matt left. Now, Liz is described as an incredible mother. She was described as having her kids be her absolute world. She was incredibly devoted to them. Being a mother gave her a sense of purpose. It was something that she totally threw herself into and she succeeded. Even though this was something that was new to her, it was something that she was really tackling on her own. She did not have Matt there during every step of the way while she was experiencing this new chapter of life, but she conquered it and she succeeded greatly. Now, because Liz was at home raising two kids now by herself, pretty much, it definitely gave her a little bit of a yearning and a desire to have more friendships, adult friendships. After being at home with her young kids day in and day out, she definitely yearned for a little bit of more adult interactions, adult conversations, and more friendships. She ended up getting a little side job in the hopes of being able to meet people and so socialize a little bit and would also just try and talk to anyone when she was out in public. She was not afraid of having conversations. She was not afraid of putting herself out there because she knew that that's what she needed. One of Liz's good friends named Nathan actually met Liz while he was working at an eyewear store and Liz walked in. She came in with her stroller with her kids and she was looking very scatterbrained, Nathan called it. She was just kind of all over the place. But the second that him and Liz were able to start a conversation and really get to talking, the two of them talked until the store just about closed. They talked about anything and everything and it just went to show that Liz Liz really just yearned for that adult interaction, and because of it, the two of them became very, very close friends. Now, once Matt returned back from deployment, him and Liz ended up moving to Liberty Station in San Diego, but this wasn't necessarily the smoothest transition. By the time Matt was back, Liz had already established a routine with her kids. She had been raising them essentially on her own up until this point as a single mother, and she already had a structure. She already had an order of how she liked to do things. And Matt coming in and not necessarily knowing what that structure was or what that order was, it definitely caused some disruption and some tension. Another big issue between the two of them was that Matt did not have a driver's license at the time. I'm not entirely sure why. However, he did not have a license, which really left a lot of the responsibility of doing anything on Liz. She was the one that had to do the grocery shopping. She was the one who had to take everyone to their appointments. If anyone needed to go grab something from the store, it had to be her. So it definitely put a lot more on her shoulders. And this definitely was a wake-up call between the relationship between Matt and Liz. Matt and Liz met at a time in their life where they had very little responsibility. They were happy-go-lucky. They were carefree. And they only knew each other a few months by the time that they had gotten engaged. So they had not really seen each other in all seasons of life, in different phases of life. And so Matt coming back and coming back to a household of responsibility because now there are two kids involved, it created, again, a lot more pressure and a lot more tension. And just to add on to it, shortly after Matt came back from deployment the second time, on Sunday, October 12th, 2014, Matt informed Liz that his parents and sister were going to be moving in with them. So now in this house, it was going to be Liz, Matt, their two children, as well as Matt's mom, Matt's mom's boyfriend, and the sister. Now, as you can imagine, This was very overwhelming news for Liz to hear, to say the least. Now, because of hearing this news, she needed to decompress a little bit. So Liz got into the car and drove over to her friend Nathan's house to vent and just to get some space from the house and from the situation. The following day, she woke up at Nathan's house and told Nathan that she was going to go back home and deal with this head on, but that she would call him later in the afternoon. Now, when Nathan didn't hear from Liz later that afternoon on the 13th, he called her. However, he could tell that by her tone of voice, she was definitely in the rush to get off the phone. Liz was giving very short one-word answers and ultimately said that she had to go and quickly hung up. 
Now, the following day is Tuesday, October 14th, and this was the day that Matt's parents or his family was supposed to move in, and their plane had landed on the early morning hours of October 14th, 2014. Now, from the time of that quick phone call between Nathan and Liz up until October 14th, Nathan was still trying to get in contact with her. He hadn't heard back from Liz at this point. He had texted her a couple times, and he had called her. However, it went straight to voicemail. Now, at this point, Nathan decided to call Matt and asked if he had heard from Liz, to which Matt claimed he hadn't heard or seen Liz since the day prior on October 13th. Now, at this point, Nathan really felt like there was something wrong, something was off, so he called the police in hopes of filing a missing persons report. However, the police really didn't take this all too seriously at the time. They definitely felt felt like Liz would show back up and told Nathan that if she didn't show back up in a couple days to give him a phone call. But again, there was no urgency on the police's side in this. So now a few days had gone by and still no one had heard from Liz. At this point, Matt's parents had officially moved in and got settled in, but it didn't really seem like anyone was worried that Liz was not there, especially in that household. It didn't seem like Matt was concerned it didn't seem like Matt's family was concerned. And this wasn't the first time that Liz had reportedly left the house without telling anyone where she was or what was going on. But her friends knew, Liz's friends knew that there was no way that Liz would just up and leave behind her kids for days on end. They knew that that was completely out of her character. So at this point, three days had gone by and Nathan decides to call the police again. And this time, police agree to go over to Matt and Liz's house to take a look around and kind of do a welfare check. Now, when police arrived, they were greeted by Matt and Liz's kids, and they started searching around the house. Now, police noticed that nothing really looked out of the ordinary, nothing looked off, and when they moved into the garage, they did see that Liz's car was still parked in the garage, and she had a parking meter ticket in there as well from the day prior. Now, inside of the garage, there was also a large mirror that had some broken glass by it, and there was also a standalone freezer that they had opened. However, it was empty. Now, as far as what was missing from the home, Matt pointed out to police that a suitcase was missing as well as Liz's computer. Now, police noted that Matt was incredibly cooperative. He was telling them everything they wanted to know. He was answering all questions. And Matt also told police that he had read some of Liz's journals. Now, apparently, Liz kept several different journals that she would write in pretty consistently, and according to Matt, when he read one of these journals, it stated inside of it that Liz had taken out $1,072 that was in her and Matt's joint checking account and moved it to her own personal account. Now, police called Liz's credit union to confirm that that was true, and they did say that that happened. So they were able to fact check that and prove that that, in fact, was the case. Now, Liz's case did not get a lot of social media coverage in the very beginning. Her picture was on flyers that were going around the San Diego area with a $1,000 reward for any information, and she was also talked about on the local news. However, this did not make national headlines at all. Along with that, there were two separate sightings of Liz. Was was from an off-duty police officer who claimed to have seen Liz on a soccer field about 1,000 yards away from her home. Home. Now, not only did this off-duty police officer claim to have seen Liz, he also have claimed to have a conversation with her as well, and he said that this was six days after she was reported missing, and he said that when he spoke to Liz, she seemed very disheveled and said that she was missing her phone and that she had slept in the park the night prior. However, that was the end of the conversation. Now, the second sighting of Liz was near the San Diego airport. But other than that, that was the extent of the possible Liz sightings. Now, Matt was also very talkative to the public during this time. He actually did an interview with People.
People magazine where he said that he was at the end of his rope and he didn't know where to look anymore for Liz and he said he was running on fumes at that point. Have you guys ever forgot about a gift on your holiday wish list where after the holidays have passed, you think, I could have really used that? Well, before we get too far into it, did you forget to add stamps.com to your holiday wish list last year? It's okay. We all make mistakes. Stamps.com has been helping businesses like yours save time and money during the holiday rush for 25 years with easy access to USPS and UPS services and premium rates for all of your postage needs. We all know that the holidays are already hard enough, but you can make things easier than ever with Stamps.com. With Stamps.com, all you need is a computer and a printer. They even send you a free scale so you'll have everything you need to get started. Started. With Stamps.com, you get your own personal post office wherever you are, and taking care of orders on the go is even easier with the Stamps.com mobile app. And if you sell products online, Stamps.com seamlessly connects with every major marketplace and shopping cart. Stamps.com has huge carrier discounts, up to 84% off USPS and UPS rates to help your bottom line. Plus, Stamps.com automatically tells you your cheapest and fastest shipping option. For 25 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses. So give your business the gift of Stamps.com so your mailing and shipping is covered this holiday season. Sign up with promo code KILLER for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code KILLER. Now, the first two people that police really looked into when it came to Liz's case was both Matt and Nathan. Now, while Matt was being very cooperative with police, Nathan was definitely being a bit more apprehensive, which led police to a lot more suspicion surrounding Nathan. Both Nathan and Matt were asked to take a polygraph test, and while Nathan said that he wasn't sure if he wanted to take it, Matt actually did a agree to take the test, and for all things considered, Matt passed the polygraph. Matt told police himself that his theory was that Liz had up and left behind her family to go off and start a new life somewhere else. Now, also during the investigation, police really leaned on a lot of Liz's journals that she had written in and left behind. It felt like being able to look at these journals was being able to get a good sense of Liz's mental state, where she was at, what she was thinking, what was going on in her life, to see if there were any clues that could help lead them to what really happened here. Now, when it came to these journals, Liz had written about how she was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder disorder, and also how she self-medicated with different prescription pills. She also wrote about self-harm in her journal and also wrote some sort of made-up story where she talked about a woman who met her knight in shining armor and then how the two of them moved to California and had a daughter, but then things went downhill and she felt like a failure and ended up walking out on her life. And for all things considered, that seemed eerily similar to the life that Liz herself had lived. So police were starting to wonder if there were some parallels between the story that Liz had written and her actual real life. Now, something else, that was a pretty big piece of information in this case was the fact that police found out that Liz was actively using the dating app Tinder right before her disappearance. Now, this definitely made police confused for a multitude of reasons. First off, she's married, and according to Matt, they did not have any sort of open relationship. However, according to Liz's friends, they told police that Liz Liz was on this dating app because she felt trapped in her own personal life and having Tinder, having a dating app definitely gave her an idea and a fantasy about freedom. She could be anyone that she wanted. She was able to go 
on there when she wanted to escape from what was going on in reality. And Liz did end up meeting some different men on the app. She was a very beautiful woman. She was very charismatic and she would meet some of these men in person as well. And this was all in the summer leading up to when she went missing. And one of these men that she met and actually formed a relationship with was a man named Steve Sutton. Now, once Liz met Steve, she really stopped entertaining any other men on the app and focused a lot on him. Liz liked Steve because she felt like he offered everything that Matt could not offer her. She felt like Steve had goals and aspirations. He wanted to better himself. She saw a lot of characteristics in him that she really liked and that she was really drawn to. Now, something that definitely made police raise an eyebrow was the fact that Steve did not want to cooperate with police whatsoever. Now, this definitely made it more difficult to understand the dynamic between Steve and Liz's relationship. However, police were still able to get a decent understanding of it. Police learned that about a month prior to Liz's disappearance, Liz was over at Steve's house that he shared with a roommate and a girlfriend. So this roommate had a girlfriend. And while Liz was over at the house, the roommate's girlfriend had walked outside and seen Liz's car and and noticed that Liz had car seats in the back of the car. And this roommate's girlfriend made an incorrect assumption, by the way. And this incorrect assumption was that Liz had kids that were being left home alone. So the roommate's girlfriend thought that these kids were just being abandoned and left home alone at Liz's house by themselves, when in reality, they were with Matt. However, the roommate's girlfriend figured that they were by themselves. And so because of this, this girlfriend actually called CPS on Liz and CPS went to Liz's house to meet with Liz and do an inspection of the home and found nothing to be wrong. However, they told Liz that by protocol, the other parent needed to be notified about the CPS report, which in turn was going to make Liz's affair now public knowledge to Matt. So according to Liz's friends, when Matt got home later that night, Liz was the one to tell him about the affair. Now, when police spoke to Matt about this instance, he played it off very cool, calm, and collected. He said he was not surprised by the affair. While it definitely caught him off guard, he wasn't really shocked and he wasn't bothered necessarily by this news. He told police that him and Liz had been living in the same same house, but living two separate lives for years at that point. He said that they slept in different beds, they had different things going on, different social lives, so it wasn't completely earth-shattering information when he was told this. And in fact, according to Matt, he claimed that Liz was the one who acted irrationally when she told him this news. So even though she told him the news, she acted irrationally, and Matt claimed that Liz Liz cut herself with the broken mirrored glass that was found in the garage that I had mentioned earlier. Now again, Steve, the boyfriend, was very uncooperative with police and did not want to speak with them from the very beginning, and he refused to take a polygraph test. Now because of this, Steve really became a focal point in the investigation. Now, Liz's father actually tried reaching out to Steve several times, and Steve did ultimately end up responding through his attorney after several attempts. And according to Steve, he claimed that a month after Liz's disappearance, Steve received an email from someone who claimed to be Liz. So again, this is a month after she had already gone missing. Steve gets this email from someone who's claiming to be Liz. But according to Steve, the email address that this was coming from was not Liz's original email address. It seemed to be a fake or different email address. And the email username was badly drawn 
girl. Now, Steve claimed that he got several emails from Badly Drawn Girl who was claiming that she was Liz. And in order to figure out if it was Liz or not, he decided to ask Badly Drawn Girl a question that only Liz would know the answer to. He ended up asking what Liz got him for his birthday that year. And to his surprise, Badly Drawn Girl responded correctly. She responded by saying that she got him a Gumby keychain for his birthday, which was the correct answer. Now, detectives asked Steve to turn over the email. That way they could trace it. They could see it. But Steve said he deleted the email from his folder and there was no way of receiving it. So police were never able to really fact check how accurate that whole interaction actually was. But it definitely is worth noting. And it was at this point in the investigation that the other possible activity from Liz started to unravel. That off-duty police officer who claimed to have seen Liz on the soccer field six days after she went missing ultimately claimed that he had his dates mixed up. Along with that, the money, that $1,000 that was transferred over into Liz's account, her personal account, was also untouched. Now, what happened around this time is that police ended up getting a warrant to look through Matt's cell phone records. And when they did this, they learned that Matt was definitely more bothered by Liz's affair than he originally led on to police. Police found text messages from Matt to Steve in September, so just a little over a month before Liz's disappearance. In one of these text messages in September, Matt wrote, quote, Liz will need a place to stay soon end quote. And another one saying, quote, I forgot to mention earlier, I work at a hospital if you need help getting that STD cleared up, end quote. Police really saw this as pure badgering from Matt's side to Steve. And along with that, it definitely seems that Matt was almost spying on Liz while she was in the house. It was clear that Matt was aware of when Liz was talking to Steve. Now, if I did not make it clear enough already, Steve Steve and Liz did continue to see each other after Matt was made aware of the affair. It's not like they broke up or stopped seeing each other. They did continue to see each other. And Matt was made aware of some of these phone calls when he said on September 29th of 2014, when he texted Steve saying, quote, glad you got to talk to her today, end quote. And then again on October 6th, 2014, saying, quote, good chat earlier, End quote. On October 7th, Matt texted, quote, Sorry to trouble you yet again, but I am going to cut her off financially soon. If you do care, please take action and support her. End quote. Now, through their investigation, police also learned some pretty big evidence when it came to the status of Liz and Matt's relationship. On October 13th, 2014, so the last day that Liz was ever seen, Liz had actually met with a divorce attorney and had planned on getting a restraining order against Matt and filing for divorce. And Liz ended up paying for that meeting on Matt's credit card. Now, on October 13th, police also saw that Matt himself actually actually made a call to the San Diego Police Department saying that he was worried that Liz was going to have him arrested for going through her emails and journals. He said he was worried that Liz was going to have him detained and called about an hour and a half later a second time to say that he noticed that the money was gone out of the joint account. And again, that was on October 13th, the last day that Liz was seen. Now, police were also able to find some very odd credit card charges from around the time that Liz went missing. On October 14th, so the day that Nathan reported her missing for the first time, Matt had actually purchased carpet cleaner on his credit card. The second charge was a month later, so a month after Liz went missing. And again, he charged to his card carpet cleaner 
and industrial large plastic wrap. And I'm talking like the big, 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 big plastic wrap. So not like the ones that you get for your kitchen or for baking or anything like that. I'm talking the big industrial plastic wrap. And when speaking to police, Matt definitely had all the answers for this. He claimed that the carpet cleaner was to clean his house for when his mom got there. And he claimed that the plastic wrap was to wrap up some of his mom's belongings and put them into storage because they couldn't all go into his house. Now, it also should be known that after some time of Liz being missing, Matt had actually deleted all pictures and posts that he had with Liz from his Facebook page and also unfriended a lot of her friends that were on his page as well. He even went to the extent of shutting down Liz's cell phone, which a lot of her friends were very upset about and her family understandably because if she was going to try and reach out, if she was going to try and call someone, she would have no way of doing that. Now, not only that, three months after Liz went missing, Matt actually moved another woman into his house. Now, of course, Matt claimed that she was a mutual friend who was going to help him watch the kids while he was looking for Liz, but him changing his Facebook relationship status to in a relationship definitely said different. So at this point, weeks are turning into months and months are turning into years. And now we're talking two years after Liz went missing. And at this point, Matt and the mutual friend that had moved into his house is now definitely his girlfriend because the two of them were expecting a baby together. And besides that, life for Matt pretty much went on as normal, but there were still no answers as to what happened to Liz. That was until two years after she went missing on October 6th, 2016, when the lead detective on this case got a phone call saying that there had been a body found on the beach at Liberty Station in San Diego. The body was found wearing jeans, a sweater, and one brown boot. And the body was less than half a mile away from where Liz lived. Now, through dental records, authorities were able to conclude that the body found on the beach was, in fact, Liz Sullivan. The autopsy report confirmed that Liz had been stabbed and beaten to death, and it was shown that she had multiple stab wounds with a sharp object, as well as a broken jaw, and her death was ruled a homicide. Now, this is going to sound pretty gruesome, and so I apologize for that, but one thing that police knew right away when it came to Liz's death, and more specifically her body, was while it was decomposed when they saw her, it wasn't as decomposed as it should have been, given the time frame of how long she had been missing. Police believe that Liz's body would not be in one piece as it was if she was subjected to the outdoor elements for two years or if she had been in the water for two years and the pathologist the forensic pathologist actually added to this conclusion because they claimed that due to the stage of decomposition that Liz's body was in it appeared that she had only been killed only one to two months before her body was discovered so not two years only one to two months which as you can imagine and I'm sure it does the same for you too just added to the confusion because Liz had been missing for two years at that point and now they're learning that based on the stage of decomposition it appears that she had only been killed about a month to two months prior to this so at this point in the investigation police want to go talk to Matt they want to let him know what they had found and also just speak with him again however to their surprise three days after Liz's body was discovered Matt moved to Maryland with with his girlfriend. Now, this seemed very, very suspicious to police because it was, but it also gave them the opportunity now to go through Matt and Liz's home and do a full forensic examination of the home before a new tenant moved into the house. Now, while they were able to do searches before in the home, they didn't have enough probable cause to do a full forensic examination and get a warrant for that while Matt was still living there. So now that he was gone, on, it really gave them the green light and the opportunity. Now, on top of that, 
Around this time is when police learn about a phone call, or I should say they relearn about a phone call that was originally brought up in the very beginning of the investigation that had a lot of question marks surrounding it. One of Liz's best friends named Calandra told police right after she went missing that Liz had called her on the night of October 13th and said that Matt was threatening to kill her. And again, that was October 13th, 2014. Now, like I said, Calandra brought this up to police in the very beginning of the investigation, but according to her, when she was telling police this, she couldn't remember what night the phone call occurred on. She couldn't remember when it exactly happened. And when she went back to look in her call log in her phone records, she couldn't find the call. So now two years later, police circled back with Calandra and they discovered that Liz made that call to Calandra on WhatsApp, which is why Calandra was not able to find it when she was going through her standard call log. And they were also able to confirm that the call was made on the night of October 13th, 2014, which was the last day that Liz was ever seen. So at this point, police go to Liz and Matt's house to begin their forensic examination, and this is where things really ramped up. Authorities did a luminol test in Liz's bathroom, and when they did, they discovered multiple blood spatter stains that had been cleaned up. Now, along with that, they also took a piece of carpet right outside of the bathroom door, and they tore that up. And when they did, they noticed a large blood-like stain underneath the carpet, and they were also able to determine determine that the blood on the carpet and in the bathroom was a DNA match to Liz Sullivan. Now, you would think at this point, the DA would say that there is enough evidence to go and arrest Matt. However, they were not so sure. They were not as convinced. So yet again, this case hits a wall for another year and police go back to the drawing board. They go back into the home of Liz and Matt and this time they go into the attic and it was while they were in the attic that they discovered a military style folding knife. Now not only that, when the knife was sent off to the forensic lab, they were able to confirm that the small blood spatter stains found on the knife was a DNA match to Liz and a DNA match to Matt. And when the DA was made aware of this new finding, this is when they gave the green light to carry out Matt's arrest. Now, on February 21st, 2020, was when Matt's trial officially began as he was being tried for the murder of Liz Sullivan. The prosecution's evidence was all of the DNA that was found, the DNA on the knife specifically. And when it came to the defense, the one thing that they really held onto was the forensic pathologist who came out and claimed that Liz's death date was not until two years after she went missing. So the defense was trying to create reasonable doubt through that, but the prosecution did have a theory for this. Now, according to the prosecutors, they believe that Liz's body was being kept in a standalone freezer that was in Matt and Liz's garage all of these years, which would explain the slowing down of decomposition. Now, when investigators first looked into the home, as I mentioned in the very beginning, they noticed that there was this freezer in the garage but that the freezer was empty. But now prosecutors believe that Matt was hiding Liz's body elsewhere, possibly in the attic during that initial search. And they believe that he wrapped Liz's body in that industrial plastic wrap that he had purchased several days before hiding her body in the freezer. They believe that Matt went to the extent of pretending that she was still alive and did that by emailing on different accounts, which would explain the email to Steve. Now, they also believe that the reason that he disposed of her body when he did was because he was moving and could not keep her body in the freezer any longer. Like I said, he moved three days after her body was discovered. It just seems a little too coincidental. Now, ultimately, the jury did reach a verdict and they decided to convict Matt on charges of second degree murder, where he is sentenced to 16 years to life in prison. 
Now, to this day, Matt still claims his innocence. He claims that he cooperated with the police from the very beginning. He claims that he passed the polygraph. He claims he has no idea what happened to Liz. He claims that he is not responsible for this. And he has maintained his innocence from the very beginning. Matt made a point that there were so many people in his house. He had his parents in his house. He had the girlfriend in his house. He had his two kids in the house. And to keep Liz's body in a standalone freezer in the garage and no one finding it for two years just doesn't seem likely which led me to believe and i did not see anything written about this so i was curious about it but matt did tell police in the beginning when it came to the industrial plastic wrap that he had a storage unit and that he was moving his mother's belongings into the storage unit which made me wonder if there was a possibility that he was keeping liz's body in the storage unit for all of these years and that's why it wasn't found in the home again that's just a theory it's just a theory but i'm very interested to hear what you guys have to say about it so definitely let me know in the comments below and with that being said you guys that is going to be all for me today thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of killer instinct again if you're new here hi my name is savannah and i'm your host of killer instinct make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button that way you never miss an episode we post weekly on the podcast every wednesday and you're not going to want to miss it i'll be back next week the brand new one for you guys and until then stay safe bye guys